Uh, welcome back to the October 26, 2021 policy session of the Board of County Commissioners. Gary Schmidt, please tee it up. Thank you, Chair Smith. Our, your first policy session today is the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office Financial Condition Analysis, County Internal Audit Engagement. We have Jody Cochran, the County's Chief Audit Executive, and uh, Sheriff Angie Brandenburg here to present, and other staff as well that will step in as needed. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Smith and Commissioners. Uh, when I first took office in January, one of my primary objectives was to determine the financial health of the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office for two reasons. First, as a means of fiscal transparency to explain to our taxpayers how their tax dollars are being used by my office. Secondly, to assess our current financial condition. So I would have a baseline to understand financial trends in our operations as the county grows and the demands for public safety services increase. I am grateful uh, that the Office of County Internal Audit was able to assist me in accomplishing this important goal. We are fortunate to have this independent office as a county resource. Uh, at the conclusion of this analysis, there are no surprises. As a provider of 24-hour public safety services, personnel costs will remain our highest financial investment. It is my intention to engage the Office of County Internal Audit in future financial analysis, or deeper dives as we call it, into our operations so that we can utilize this data to inform decision making in alignment with our strategic business plan. Uh, as noted in the report, the financial health of the Sheriff's Office is closely tied with the financial health of the county. And this information may also be of value to inform you all on trends, financial trends that may impact the county as a whole. Uh, I also believe it is, will be beneficial for my office uh, as well as the county uh, for the Sheriff's Office to engage in the same financial condition analysis cycle as the county. Uh, I want to note that the full report that we have that we'll be talking about today is located on our Sheriff's Office website. So now I will turn it over to uh, Jody, who will kind of give us a, a run through the report. Perfect. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Smith, Commissioners, Administrator Schmidt. Uh, thank you for sharing your time this afternoon. Uh, like uh, Sheriff said, I am Jody Cochran. I am the county's internal auditor, and our senior internal auditor, Kathy Young, is uh, joining us as well to present the results of our 2021 financial condition analysis of the Sheriff's Office financial health, or fiscal health, excuse me. We are briefly going to kind of talk about why this engagement is important, what the work was, <coughs> what was learned, and what we advised. And I think we had a PowerPoint, so if we could just jump to that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Probably the next slide. Thank you. So the Office of County Internal Audit is an independent and objective, unbiased resource for the county, its residents, and its stakeholders. We provide assurance, consulting, and investigative services. To ensure the independence, the County Internal Auditor reports and operates in a dual reporting governance structure. I report functionally to the Internal Audit Oversight Committee, a committee made up of community members, board members, and county leadership. Administratively, I report to the elected county treasurer, Brian Nava, who is the first ever county internal auditor appointed in 2015. This reporting structure allows the office to be free of influence or pressure, resulting in the greatest value add for the county. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Chair Smith and Vice Chair Savas, who's not here today, for participating in the Oversight Committee, as well as all the board members for your continued support of the county internal audit function. It really speaks to um, your commitment to transparency and to accountability and to our efforts on uh, building trust through good government. So thank you. Next slide. Over the 11 year period from 2010 to 2020, 64% of the Sheriff's operational fund revenue has come from the county general fund. 30% of the total county expenditures and transfers to other funds has gone to the Sheriff's office. As the Sheriff indicated, this engagement was conducted at her request to enhance transparency and accountability for our residents. County Internal Audit designed the engagement to provide objective, independent, high-level view of the, of the financial health of the Sheriff's Office. The Sheriff's collaboration and cooperation in allowing us unrestricted access to the data was essential and very much appreciated. 
In addition to demonstrating how we can build trust through good government, <coughs> this engagement establishes a baseline and tools for ongoing trend analysis and monitoring of fiscal sustainability. Next slide. As a result of this unrestricted access to the sheriff's subsidiary data, data at the division and account level, we were able to, to, excuse me, to develop an analysis of the financial health of the sheriff's office, which supplements the existing county financial condition analysis reports prepared by the county internal audit office. The most recent county report was issued in 2020. Both analyses are based on standards developed by the International City and County Management Association, ICMA. This is the professional group that Administrator Schmidt referred to a few weeks ago after attending the ICMA conference here. To enhance transparency and understanding <coughs> of the Sheriff's Office finances, we designed an approach which identifies and reports key 11-year trends for the Sheriff's Office as a whole and for each of its divisions. This approach supports familiarity <coughs> and easy comparison of the Sorry. presented data. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> as you read the report, the data present is presented in a repeated fashion for each division. So first, the data is presented in narrative form, and that provides observations and context. And then the following pages present six unique and repeated then data images. For the sheriff's office as a whole and for each of the divisions, the report addresses revenue by source, expenses by type, revenues and expenditures per capita, personal services costs by type, as well as using person or population and FTA counts uh, to support further analysis of that financial data. This engagement was designed to provide a baseline of high level division data. It is a report of what was what divisional fun financial transactions occurred each year since 2010. The engagement was not an analysis of effectiveness of policy decisions, a verification of data, or a statement of data accuracy. All the subsidiary data was tied to the county's annual financial reports, and we relied on the work <coughs> of the external financial auditors in that relative uh, report data. This initial analysis did not delve too far into the weeds. Revenues reported at a high level by source, general fund, levy, local contracts, service charges, and grants. Expenses at that same high level were analyzed for overall personal services, materials and services, and cost allocations. We further delve into personal services to the extent of breaking down to general compensation and fringe benefits. The goal is to provide transparency to and to establish a starting point for further analysis. The report, as the sheriff said, is publicly available on the county internal audit website as well as the sheriff's um, audit, or excuse me, a sheriff's site. I really appreciate her willingness to provide that link on her website to that information. Next page. <coughs> The 2020 county condition, financial condition analysis indicated the county's financial health was stable with favorable debt, liquidity, fund balance, and credit rating indicators. This supplemental analysis of the financial health of the sheriff's office indicates some similar stability. The sheriff's office operations fund has a balanced budget. Like the county, the sheriff's operation fund revenues are trending upward and are being outpaced by an upward trend in expenditures. This analysis confirms what we intuitively know, that the jail <coughs> and divisions are the largest of nine divisions. Like Gary says, people are our most important asset. They are also our biggest expense. This expense relative to the total sheriff's office expenses is remaining consistent from year to year, around 70% of all expenses. Fringe benefits as a percent of compensation is increasing. This is a significant trend to watch. Overall, the observations of increases in expenses outpacing revenue growth for both the county and the sheriff's office are trends which have extended over multiple years. In addition to monitoring this activity closely, strategies to address the changing relationship between revenues and expenses should be pursued. The sheriff's office expenditures per capita for fiscal year 2020 was $234.89 per resident. Jail division expenditures per capita for that same time period is four, excuse me, $72.21, while the patrol division was uh, $89.51 per capita for fiscal year 20. 
These and other data points are all provided in more detail in the report. Next slide. So what do we advise? This consulting engagement was not designed to provide assessments or recommendations for future improvements. There were no recommendations for actions to be addressed by the sheriff. The report is simply a statement of what was. We do offer advice for continued transparency and impact. Further analysis into areas and trends which raise questions will support future decisions and operational strategies. Repeating the financial condition analysis at consistent intervals will maximize the value of the trend data. That may be every year, every three to five years, again, at the discretion of the sheriff. Additionally, incorporating more operational data in the analysis will enhance transparency and the availability of relevant information. So again, I want to thank the board for your time today and to the sheriff for her commitment, uh, her curiosity, her attention to continuous improvement, well-informed decision-making and strategies, and overall transparency. This engagement is a great example of building trust through good government, and it was a pleasure to work with the sheriff and her team. I look forward to more opportunities to collaborate in the future. So again, happy to answer any questions about the engagement, the design, the process, the results. Um, yeah, really appreciate your time and your interest. Thank you, both of you coming forward. Angie, when you came to this board and um, pled your case for a 12% increase, uh, to the voters <clears throat> for, are the, for your levy. Um, you said you were conducting two financial um, look-sees, so to speak, an audit and so forth. And, and, and you said you would be releasing those details. So this is in keeping with what you promised the citizens of Clackamas County that you would do when the audit was complete, bringing forth that information so they could see it. I wanna thank you uh, for keeping that promise and coming forward today and revealing this information. I think that's great. I have a few questions. Um, you know, I have my, my blue tabs here and I've been going over this, probably not as much as, much as I should. And, um, and I should have submitted the questions to you ahead of time, but frankly, time got away from me. I, I wanna um, thank you very much for this. You know, you say, um, what we found, what we discovered is that fringe benefits as a percent of compensation is increasing, and that's just not unique to the sheriff's department. I think that's, you know, the cost of medical insurance is going up, the cost of this is going up, the cost is also COLA. I think COLA in the short term is very concerning to us uh, as, as the financial housekeepers of all of our departments. How do you think that's going to affect you uh, in the next year? Well, the COLAs keep going up and it's, um, you know, our contract was recently settled, the POA contract, um, which is a um, collective bargaining agreement um, that the county reaches with our union. And so it does impact us. Um, and I don't remember what the COLA was, what we landed on. 1.8? Yeah, 1.8. For this um, coming fiscal year. And that was a big deal. Um, uh, from your department because we're trying to get 1.8 across the board for all of our contracts. And the fact that the sheriffs or the uh, POA settled on the 1.8 was a very significant, uh, I guess, in their allowance because um, I think they were asking for more. And I understand why they're asking for more, but that was, um, it did not go unnoticed, let's say, uh, by, uh, by me or any of our board members. Regarding uh, the 12 cent increase going forward, of course, we're not gonna be collecting for that until the end of 22, right? Right. Okay, so we anticipate, we think we know what revenues are, but sometimes revenues come in slower than we anticipate. Does a 12% going to, I have, this is kind of a loaded question, will that 12% increase maintain the current status quo or Will we be able to expand our patrol? So are you at the 12, 12 cent or 12 percent? I mean 12 cents. Okay, okay. Um, we, yeah, so we, it, this will expand all of the things that we said we would do. The continuation of the levy continues the services that were paid for this year. We'll continue that and we'll add the services that we have in the levy. And we don't have a choice in that. That's, by law, we're required to provide those services. And yes, so we are, and Carmel, you know, working with 
the county administrator having a balanced budget and moving forward and the citizens will see uh, those levy funded positions come to fruition. Uh, Jody, you mentioned in your opening statement <clears throat> on a per capita basis, <clears throat> the patrol cost is about $89 per resident per capita. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the national trend or the state trend for that number? Boy, I, that's a good uh, question. It's pretty low, isn't it? I bet your financial people behind you know that, Angie. You do, you do know? You do not. Know. Okay. Well, that used to be something that when I was a commissioner last time that the sheriff's yes, department know. would talk about is, you know, we're putting our deputies on the streets for a lot less than other jurisdictions do it, uh, mainly because our county is so large, uh, our population is growing. That is a number that I would think that um, you could get a hold of. Happy to do so. And just email it, you know, you don't sure. have to have a presentation. Absolutely. Um, regarding your patrol and your response, what type of calls <coughs> do you respond to? What type of calls? What kind of calls? I'm thinking Dewey, burglary, domestic violence. We respond to everything. If a citizen calls and they would like a response, we respond. So, and it depends on the priority of how, uh, how far in the queue they are, how if deputies are available, and the priority of the call. So if there's an active assault going on, um, that is a higher priority than someone who's calling in a cold theft or a cold burglary. And it would depend, I, too, on the availability of your patrols. For instance, in South County, um, you know, I see patrols out there, and I love seeing patrols out there, but there's a big distance to travel between, for instance, Sandy and the city of Malala and up the mountain. So with the addition, an additional 12 cents, how is that going to make those cities closer together for your patrols to respond to? Do you anticipate putting on your metrics, do you anticipate putting more patrols out there so your response times uh, can be quicker? Yes, so part of the levy uh, funded, the voters funded, thank you uh, voters for that. Uh, 16 patrol positions will be added. And we have, a, you know, it's 24 seven. Um, so those will be added, those positions will be added across our shifts. Um, and depending on, on um, you know, when the calls come in, um, where we need to, to put them and place them, it'll be very a thoughtful process about that, about where they, which, which shift and the areas that they'll be assigned to. So we're currently working on our staffing study that we've began at the beginning of the year. It's been a little difficult because of COVID and working with our consulting firm uh, for the staffing study, but that will also be a guiding factor about where we will put um, folks on patrol. When do you anticipate your staffing study to be completed? Pretty soon, by the end of the year. So we're in the final stages of that, um, and we will um, have that. The, that will be hugely helpful for us to decide um, where they go. The staffing study will has talked about, um, are we working uh, the right shifts, the amount of hours with the resources that we have? So it will be an informed decision about where those folks go. Is that something you want to share with the board or no? Oh, after, yes, yes, we will come okay. to the board so after that next year sometime. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we're excited. Um, we're excited to share it. So um, here's a little note on the side since fiscal year 2010, fringe benefits have increased from 17% to 54%. And that is, um, that is a big, that's a big increase, but I don't think we can expect people to go out you know, put their lives on the line for anything less. So when you say that the county's overall financial condition needs to be healthy, that is in direct support of, you know, the sheriff's department and many other departments that we fund. And, you know, I can't bring that point home enough. Do we have any comments? Yes, we do. Commissioner <laughs> Fisher, please, you're up. Oh, so I was <laughs> curious, and I really like the way that the report does the per capita, what this, Costs. So in, we have a, quite a few law enforcement agencies throughout Clackamas County because we have all of our jurisdictions. So when it says, was it 89 for patrol um, per resident? So every resident in Clackamas County, that's how it comes out too. Yes. But then they would pay more if they're in a city for that level of service because we do not patrol. Clackamas County Sheriff does not patrol in like Lake Oswego or those areas or 
I mean, I know they do in the unincorporated parts, we, Well, we do. I mean, to travel back and forth between the cities, so that's sheriff's patrol. But also, you get the core services of the sheriff's office, so the jail, um, civil service, that, that type of thing. Yeah. And, we, and then a lot uh, of services we provide with the cities, and Jody can probably talk. Well, go ahead, Jody. Oh, no, I was just going to say that that calculation, uh, Commissioner, really is just total expenses divided by total county residents. So it's as simple as that calculation. So it really isn't a direct tie to any sort of addition of fees by area or, or by taxpayer. So just to clarify what, what that calculation is. Okay, so for residents that live in areas that have their own law enforcement agency, they pay more than, for patrol at least. The, I mean, I know that the jail, I love the way this is laid out too. Um, because it has, <laughs> it, it, for it has it for each area. And I really like to see what that costs, $72 per mm -hmm. capita for the jail or something like that, close to that. So that's good. But it is more for the people. It, w it would be more because you're paying for your police services, your dedicated services in, within in your cities. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure I yep. understood all that correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Commissioner Scholl. Yes. Um, Jody, you said that the sheriff department's revenues are going up, but expenditures are going up a little faster? Yes. Okay. Next year, the new levy kicks in, correct? Will that, will that mitigate this problem and slow down this tendency <laughs> for expenditures to be higher than your revenues? And if not, what can be done to get that under control? Because your new levy is good for eight years, right? Five years, five years, okay? Now, this year, total property taxes in the county went up 3.79%, total valuation. So that should have a corresponding effect on your, on your levy. So, what was the, what's the plan to looking at where you're at now to make sure that in a few years we don't have a problem that we can't alleviate because of the lack of money? Well, the levy is standalone. So the levy funds the levy position. So mm -hmm. that, is, that is a straight, that's not in this equation. So we've been in this position for the last many, many years. Um, and you know, Paul has been here when we come before the budget committee that we are, we are spending more than we are bringing in. And it's mainly related to personnel costs. And so um, that's something that we've been wrestling with as the county, and it's not unique to the sheriff's office, it's also the county's has the same issue. We've cut, we've trimmed, we've gone line by line in our budget with the county administrator. Um, our, our materials and services are, you know, we're, we're, living, we're living lean. And so um, our money is in people, and we want to keep our people because we know that crime isn't going down. It's slightly increasing. Um, so it, this is something that I think Gary may um, be able to contribute to some of the conversation. Yes, if I may. So Sheriff Brandenburg has been a fantastic partner and collaborator working with me and the other departments to help really trim our costs, to have a sustainable budget, which we finally have after a long, long time, at least 10 years. But the scenario constantly changes, right? So it's never static. So we have to keep, keep make sure we maintain that level of sustainability in the budget. But the Sheriff, you've been fantastic. Thank you for all you have done to collaboratively work on how you can do your part to have a really lean budget, which you do. And the county does, it's an ongoing issue, commissioners, as you all know. So we're all working together with your guidance to have a stable, secure budget going forward, knowing that everything constantly changes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Gary. Uh, any other comments or questions from commissioners? I have, I have a question, if I may, and that is, uh, and maybe it's not to be answered today, but it's something I'd like to explore, and that is how um, as we talk about cost going up and so forth, and how is the, how do we ensure that the service level the cities receive, the contract cities receive, are equivalent to, you know, per capita what it may be for the amount paid or, <clears throat> or the amount of revenue that is directed from the general fund, and also ELED, right? So there's all these different factors, and, and we're just not really sure where that is, and are they experiencing the same kind of increases um, 
are they absorbing that as contract cities? And that may be the question. That's <laughs> so Nancy Artman, Star Finance Guru Manager. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't initially yeah. want to put anyone on the spot today, okay. so I didn't want to surprise. But in the future, it was more where I was kind of going. That maybe that's something we look at. Do you have that? Oh, sorry, which way? So don't feel any obligation, Nancy. So <laughs> it's okay. I don't want to put you on the spot. Good afternoon, everyone. Nancy Artman, Sheriff's Finance Manager. Good questions. Uh, what we're experiencing with the ELAD is similar to where the levy was before we had the renewal and the increase. So the ELAD at this point in time has reached maximum capacity of what it is able to absorb. And we'll soon be in a position where it's not able to cover a proportionate share of all costs. The cities are being charged full amount. They are accounting for those increases in their budgets. And we are receiving full compensation for those costs year over year. But the ELED is something that the sheriff is looking into and, and we'll discuss that further with you as we get into the budget season. Yeah. So um, is there, in the, not today, but is in the future, um, is there a similar scenario for the cities? Are the cities experiencing cuts? in service like we are? Uh, they are not. The cities mm -hmm. have budgeted. Happy Valley has their own public safety levy. Wilsonville is also uh, doing some long-term planning, Estacada as well. So they are planning to actually add positions to meet their service levels, and they are planning those costs so that we are receiving full recovery of cost for service. Okay. Great. Well, thank, thanks for that. I'm looking forward, well, sort of speak, oh, the budget season, right? We'll look forward to those those deeper discussions and that, you know, and I just related, but I just want to let, let my colleagues aware, and I'm going to talk about it under under um, comments today, and that is that I had a robust discussion last night with the library district, and they are going back to the core mission and what the ballot measure said, just like some ELED people are saying, the ballot measure said this and you're not doing it, or the library district said this and you're not doing it. So we've got, you know, I guess adjustments to make or, or maybe a statement to make to the voters that we're going to have to reestablish what the baseline is. Right. Uh, I think all the, all the districts or all the levies that are out there that have certain promises in there or, you know, when, when the voters actually, you know, said yes, you know, get to find out where we're, where we're lacking and make whatever adjustment we can so that we're not held accountable, basically, for the impossible right now mm -hmm. when costs are going this way and the levy's not, or ELED or whatever is not keeping up. And that's a great point, Commissioner. It's the exact conversation that we're having. Internally, the sheriff is cognizant of what the ELED founding document stated and what the mission is related to that. So as we have these conversations about what we are able to do, we're keeping an eye toward what the incorporating document stated would happen. And I think we've done a very good job of remaining true to that. The time has come where we need to have some of those conversations to determine what is sustainable long term and within the means of the district's funding year over year. Yeah, great. Is that it, Paul? One other thing, and I mentioned this to, um, I mentioned this also the other day, um, I'm hearing from emergency responders and sheriff's office is one of those, but I, have, I haven't, you know, I really want to touch on it here, just get it out there, and that is um, from fire, you know, and, and paramedics and everyone else that responds, and that is the number of calls, calls for service that are related to people in a, you know, a human crisis, the houseless, you know, so forth, and how that's impacting it, and, and really the resources you have out there, number one, to deal with it, and then the priorities that are compromised you know, in essence, to, to serve those needs. So, again, not a discussion for today, but I think it's also another factor where if we happen to experience a greater level of income when the supportive housing services dollars come over, are there funds to help deal with that or are there mechanisms? I always talked about a mental health facility we can take people to or, you know, drug alcohol facilities and so forth for those crises. Um, but, you know, if, if we can because they're the same people, right? And when they need to be helped. And so I, I don't know how we do that. And, and it's, can, it's kind of, it's taken away from the, the, the original intent of the sheriff's office and to some degree that, you know, you're responding to, you know, crime and all those other things. And you guys are spread thin, I, I know that. Yeah, and we look forward to working with you on mental health resources because we can divert folks who are coming to our jail that don't belong in the jail. Um, there are very few resources for us to divert 
folks. And so when it gets to the level where we're interceding, um, it's, it's to the point where um, if we had been able to intervene earlier, get folks into some help, well, now we are here and it's a crime that's occurred. And then now that person's entering the criminal justice system. When before, if we had the resources, we could have diverted that. So, you know, a third of our jail population have mental health uh, conditions that they take medication for. Um, so the support of housing services, the work you guys are doing is gonna be welcome uh, music to our ears and law enforcement because we need, we need to have resources to get folks into, to divert them from the criminal justice system. So we're well, more than happy to help with that. Paul, to <clears throat> make your point on page 65 of the packet regarding the ELD, the little side note say, uh, fund balance, though trending upward, experienced a 72% decrease in fiscal year 20. What does that mean? So if you could just point me to... Page 65 on... On the report? Yeah, on the report. In your pack. Mm -hmm. Everybody turn to that. For the ELD. Mm -hmm. Page 65. I think that's page 65 in the overall packet. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about... Um, so that, that first graph. Enhanced law enforcement district, yeah. Uh, the first, uh, yes. And your side note here, Jody, I'm just reading mm -hmm. here, side note, experienced a 72% decrease in fiscal year 20. Yes, yeah, so if you look at the second uh, uh, graph below that, yes. there was a significant um, draw on that fund because expenditures were were exceeding the revenues in that year. And so that, that it, it, it contributed to that decrease in that one year. Right now, that 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 trend is is going up still. But just being aware that the uh, the expenditures as they as they come up that are so that was basically a draw on our savings account. Absolutely. That was money in the bank that they yeah. used. Okay. Absolutely. And then the second bullet point says <clears throat> fund balance gains were significantly impacted by fiscal year 20 with a shortfall of three hundred and sixty thousand yes. dollars. Same thing on that. Absolutely, and that and that's that right. that is that is the impact that we're talking about. Absolutely, Nancy. And that is a result, chair of what I was talking about a little bit earlier, with the ELAD not able to absorb all costs. Um, in the past, if you recall, we had tried to set aside a little bit of funding um, from fiscal year to fiscal year in the attempts of adding a deputy. What we determined is that we couldn't support all of the costs of the ELAD with the current revenue versus right. the expenditures. And so those funds were used just to pay for the cost to offset the ELAD. So my next question for you, we had um, three declared emergencies, of which two, the fire and the ice storm, the sheriff responded uh, with great success with a lot of expenditures, a lot of time and people hours. How did those emergencies affect the bottom line of these budgets? That's a great question, Chair. Uh, ultimately, because of COVID, we were, it seems odd and counterintuitive, we did have some cost savings because we weren't sending people out to training. We had less overtime in some instances because we weren't putting deputies in harm's way by responding to um, grant activities and things that we used to do. So we were able to help mitigate some of that. Right now, we're working to get reimbursement from FEMA. Um, county Finance is heading that effort and has done a wonderful job of putting that application together, but we won't see those dollars, quite truthfully, for probably one to two <coughs> fiscal years by the time that that's taken care of. So um, we've been able to get through the fiscal year, even with those two instances, but we've put off some things that we direly need. We have failing equipment, for instance. Um, our SWAT armored vehicle is pretty much rendered useless at this point in time and is in dire need of replacement. Um, we put off some deferred maintenance where we can on certain items. We really just did the bare minimum. That's going to impact us coming forward into this next fiscal year when all of that's going to come due and we're gonna to have to address those issues. I see you received $106,000 in grants and other revenues. Is there any way to apply for more grants someplace? 
We, we have. In fact, we just recently were awarded a COPS grant for a behavioral health person. Mm -hmm. um, for oh, patrol. nice. So we're really excited about that. Wow. So we, we, I don't have a staff person that is exclusively a person who manages grants. Um, and so we're absorbing that within our folks already. So well, that we're, figuring, is a, we're, we're figuring that out because we, we know there are many grants out there that we have access to. It's more about staffing to manage the grants and to apply for the grants. And so that's one area that we, we've recognized that we can step up. That is a skill set. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But yeah. also grants are difficult to hire folks on. So we're comfortable with a behavioral health person because that's con contracted work. And I believe we're doing that with um, HRS. Is that right? So, um, you know, but hiring full-time folks uh, to be hired on grants is problematic in the long term because, you know, we don't have the money to continue. Um, having those folks. Stay and on. is it cost effective? I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I have no idea if you were able to have a grant person, whether you would bring in enough money not only to pay for that position to make it worthwhile. I just have no idea in the world of grants for law enforcement. It's, uh, it's out of my ballywick for sure. Statistics point to yes, that generally when you have a dedicated grant administrator or grant position, that they more than make up for their compensation. Um, what we're doing right now, Chair, is really focusing on grants that are something that we can do in collaboration with other entities within the county or those that will pay for goods. And that way we can offset some of our other costs in materials and services. And that's, as the Sheriff alluded to, it's more sustainable. Bringing on a staff person and having them for a two or three year cycle, depending on what the funding is, and then having to figure out a way to keep that person on board is not something that mm -hmm that I believe that any of us have an appetite to do because there just isn't additional funding available. Okay. Commissioner. Our staffing study has identified um, having a grants uh, person help manage grants, apply for grants. Um, that's one of, the, one of the recommendations of that in the sneak peek. Thank you. Commissioner Fisher. Thank you. A couple questions looking towards the future. I, um, like every day we open the paper and we read what's happening mostly to the north of us, some all around us, but just the increase in crime and especially the increase in shootings and homicide. So my question is, are we seeing an increase here in Clackamas County as well, or are we expecting to, and what are we doing to plan for that? So I know we're having a public safety town hall on November the 3rd, mm -hmm. so I'm preparing some statistics for that. So we are seeing a slight uptick. Mm -hmm in persons crimes and property crimes um, and um, folks who are um, perhaps arrested who are armed with firearms is a trend that's going up. Um, so um, it would seem that we are being impacted by that. So the levy funding for us to get more cops on the street, I think will help because um, it, it provides that proactive um, seeing law enforcement officers on the street, which does deter crime. Um, and then also will help us respond to crimes faster, mm -hmm. right? So we can catch the perpetrators. And then I know our district attorney is very good about holding our folks accountable. So, um, so we are, um, I think, I'm happy to live in Clackamas County. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that as we pull some more of these crime statistics, um, we'll be able to share that with you. Keep okay. you apprised. And then my next question, I'm looking towards the future. There's been some analysis in the past before I've been on the board of looking at a law enforcement district countywide so that it's not piecemealed around the county. Any thoughts about that? I mean, looking at this financial analysis, has this taken us one step closer to this would be a good idea, this isn't a good idea? Well, I think a lot of work has to be done. I've had many, many um, conversations with the county administrator about that service district um, possible um, funding option. And I think we have to see, is it right for our community? And is it something the community wants? So there is, um, I think there is um, some traction for us to do some work to determine that. Okay. Because I'm also looking at funding a jail could be funded potentially through a law enforcement district with bonding and different financing tools. Just, and I don't know the process if that's something, we got a lot going on right now. There's a lot going on. If, so. we, didn't, if we wouldn't have had COVID in the middle of everything, we <laughs> might be farther along on some of this, but really lean on you for that sort of time frame of when's the right time to 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I said, uh, so County Administrator Schmidt and I have been in many talks. We meet regularly to discuss these things. So, um, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing what those options might be and if, um, if that's what the community wants. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, um, Commissioner Fisher's question uh, triggered another memory thought um, and the thing I've been kind of watching and, you know, after 20 what is it, 24 years now of going to local community meetings and hearing what's going on and hearing sheriff's reports sometimes when, there's, when the, a deputy is there to give a report for the local area. Um, and people asking certain questions and we're seeing, you know, in the last 24 years, let's face it, the number of calls have gone up significantly, crime's gone up significantly, um, as, as, I, as I can see and, real, and uh, realize. So I'm just wondering, um, going back to my business experience and some interactions I've had with sheriff deputies um, um, on certain calls at times, I've, I've heard um, a number of deputies at times say, yeah, our two highest call for service areas are here and here, right? And I think we know where here and here has been historically. and. Um, and it's, it, it seems, you know, for example, here and here is, you know, Kazi Monterey area is one big area of call for service back in the day when I, when I had my, when we were, um, had my business in place. And the other one was Rothy Road, where a number of apartments are in that one particular area. So it's been related to, to, to higher density areas where it's more people concentrated, more, more areas for crime. So as, as uh, our density is basically increasing in a certain particular area, um, I'm expecting those calls for service, which already are going up, to go up even more so. And I don't know if people really understand or calculate that, but no, that is a cost, and um, I, it's a concern also, and if we can actually meet the need, right, for those extra calls. So I'd be interested in knowing, um, and you and I have talked about this, but interesting kind of knowing what 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 we need to consider and factor in when we look at changing zoning for higher densities and what what support what services do we need to enhance and law enforcement being one of them you know um, services for people in mental health crises um, uh, drug alcohol addiction things that come with that let alone the petty crime theft everything for people to to, to fund their drug habit or whatever it may be so I, I I, I would like to know if you if you cite any trends that we can actually take a look at um, and factor in when we make some of our, our decisions. I think people want to. I hear when I go door to door, <laughs> you know, as people saying, "I moved out of this particular area to come to Clackamas County to get away from, you know, what what that where where there was, and we know where that is." And I just don't want to. Um, getting back to the question earlier, um, I just don't want to see us. Um, you know, get in that position. So um, whatever we can do from uh, being thoughtful about how we plan our communities to be safe and um, and uh, retain our quality of life here in the county and do it affordably so it doesn't impact us. So that's a lot, but I'm just kind of, you know, I'd love your, in, in, your input on that. Yeah, I mean, more more people equals more crime. When we, when we um, as uh, patrol deputies drive around and they see um, high density apartment complexes going in, and we know that because um, there's more people, there will be more reported crime. So it will, crime will go up. And so, and then as we decide what patrol deputies, where they go, do they go in South County where you'll get a call, you know, I'm just, one, one an hour, or do you go and put more deputies into a place where you know it's, you're going to one call every 15 minutes. So um, that's how our services are driven um, by the higher density population. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just make, I'll just give you, I have two, I had two locations when I was in business, <clears throat> a quarter, not even a quarter mile, but a couple blocks away from each other. And the first area I was at, the first location I was at, um, had a modest amount of crime, nothing too serious, nothing too frequent. But when I opened up my second location, which happened to be right next to the Econolodge Hotel, before it was Econolodge Hotel, before it was actually there, um, I couldn't believe the increase. And in, I mean, it was, it was constant. Break-ins cars being stolen, things being stolen, and everything else. Two blocks away, that much, diff that much difference. And uh, I'll never forget the first time we made a call when the sheriff's deputy came out, I <coughs> expressed that very same thing. And his words to me were, Rothy Road, Ina, right here. It's one of our highest call areas. And so that just, 
emphasized to me that sometimes that's really location, you know, obviously, again, that high, high density area, but, but actually when you start to look at the demographics of the, um, not the precinct, not, not the district, what's the, what's the small, the, the census tract? When you look at the census tract and you look at that poverty level, you know, it's, it's extraordinarily high right there in that particular area. So it, it always concerns me about the safety and the welfare of kids, especially, um, that uh, are exposed to that. And, then, you know, Rex Putnam High School is just up the street, you know, and it just, it just concerns me about the welfare of people that are indirectly in harm's way or directly in harm's way. Thank you for that. Any other comments from commissioners? Well, thank you again for coming forward and uh, giving this report on full transparency to our public. We look forward to your next study uh, next year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Gary. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank everyone. Thank you. We'll move on to our next policy session, approval of a revised advisory member code of conduct policy. Chris Lyons from Public and Government Affairs will present. You had asked for this information, commissioners few months ago, so this is just closing the loop with you and seeking your approval of the policy. Hello again, commissioners. Chris Lyons, Public and Government Affairs. Uh, here today to seek your approval uh, on a revised advisory member code of conduct policy. Uh, for a little bit of background, uh, Clackamas County supports 50 advisory boards and commission, approximately 50 advisory boards and commissions, which we call <coughs> ABCs, uh, which are comprised of community members appointed by the board to provide insight on specific county programs. And these members offer their insights and expertise on um, programs and other items that the county is making decisions on to make sure that we are reflecting community values. As part of that work, the county maintains a code of conduct policy that communicates our expectations of these advisory members. Uh, these members sign a form which is included in the policy here at, when they apply to be a member on a uh, county committee. The policy is a few years old, and so we, PGA, have worked with admin and county council and the equity inclusion office to update the existing policy with a number of revisions, which are outlined in your worksheet. It includes everything from updating the formatting, renaming the policy to better describe its purpose, um, clearly defining roles of ABC members, clearly outlining expectations and generally clarifying the provisions within it. Uh, in, in addition, it includes references now to government ethics laws, restrictions on political campaigning, and mandatory child abuse reporting. Uh, as part of this update, we have vetted this updated version with uh, the Community, Committee for Community Involvement and the Clackamas County Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council. Uh, both of which had no concerns with uh, what's been done. Um, so our recommendation today is for your approval of this updated policy. And as you'll see in the packet, we've included both the latest draft as well as the current version that we're operating on that we are seeking to amend. So happy to answer any questions. Uh, this is uh, mainly for our volunteers, or so our volunteers can understand <clears throat> what their duties are, you know. Correct. Yes, and it's up to each, is it up to each individual board or commission to cut their meetings according to their adopted um, business rules, or is that separate? So each ABC has its own set of bylaws. Mm -hmm. This is kind of overarching county policy on top of those. Those bylaws mo may go into more detail um, for that particular. <coughs> okay. Um, any, oh, yes, Commissioner Fisher. You Thanks. slid your card up there. <coughs> no, I can't find it, darn it. Well, um, we'll wait. Well, um, That's nice. So I was just looking at this and I was thinking back when I was a young, young mom and I was on an ad, the local inter, early intervention advisory council to Multnomah County. And 
we were the group of mothers on that group were able to do a lot in advocating not only with the county but with the other entities as well so i'm just wanting there was something in here that says something about the interests of the county act within the boundaries of authority as advisory to the board of county commissioners i just don't know what all that means i wouldn't want to limit if somebody is a is on a on a um, advisory council, they may have some expertise that would be very well utilized to, you know, have a voice. I don't want to limit anyone's voice with this code of conduct. <clears throat> where are you seeing? Where are you looking in the document? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, is under number three. Number three. Code of conduct, maybe. I mean, it's, it's referenced a little bit. Like, it's. Um, I, I just. I'm just concerned about that. I want to make sure that we are limiting Rem our Roman volunteers. Roman numeral number three, Paul. So you. Yeah, just, Roman, Roman numeral number three under. Um, I mean, I think that's what she's talking to. General policy. Uh, under under the Clackamas County policy. But I'm not sure. I'm not seeing it. It's. Um, You know, I think the general goal here is that. You know, act within the boundaries of authority as advisory to the Board of County Commissioners. That's what the ABCs are. They yeah. are so, just advise us. They don't set policy. Is that what you mean? It says this code of conduct requires that all advisory members. So it's I just want to make sure we're not limiting. If somebody's a volunteer advisory board member, that we aren't limiting their individual voice. Can you tell me what page you're on? I, I can help. This is the first attachment. It says Clackamas County Policy, right. page two. Okay. And it's the it's the bullets one, two, three, fourth bullet down from the top of the page. Okay. It's hard to see, like, because I have only a limited little section on my iPad. But, I mean, you can just tell me what the right. intent is I, of yeah. the Code of Conduct. It's, this yeah, is Stephen may be able to advise on this. I, my interpretation is this is just clarifying that they are a volunteer and their role in the process is to advise the board in its authority as the decision makers. I think an example maybe of someone um, uh, outside of that policy would tell maybe a, a staff person to go do something and direct them to go do something and they can't. Oh. They're advisory, right? So I, I, that might be one example, maybe not the best. And, I, and, and then I think to your point, Commissioner, the bylaws of each imp specific uh -huh. ABC will uh, clarify what the scope is that they are working under as part of that group. Does scope mean boundary in this word, Stephen? Well, it's not new. This is in the original one as well, and it's what would be expected of anybody appointed to any committee. You don't do mission creep. You don't go rogue. You're appointed to advise on parks and recreation. You don't start gathering information on the sheriff's ELED and bring that into the conversation. So mm -hmm. you're appointed to advise on this particular government element, and that is your realm, that is your boundary. If you wanted to deviate, you would apply for the Board of Property Tax Appeal or something else along those lines. <coughs> That's expected of really of any type of government official. You stay within your lane and your areas of, of expertise. So I guess, and it says serve the best interests of the advisory board, committee, commission, or council as a whole, regardless of personal interests. So I guess it's just some qualifying language that while, while, while serving in the role of advisory member, I mean, it shouldn't be that in their personal capacity. Well, that's interest of the organization and the entity ahead of your own, ahead of your own personal bias. And that's in the original one, too. So that's not really new language either. And that's what you have expected of your hamlets and your villages and your CPOs, is that folks think for the collective good as opposed to the individual <laughs> interest. It also speaks to, mm -hmm. to conflicts. You're not promoting your self-interest. I want to rezone my land. Right. Or I'm only yeah. concerned about this. It's like you're thinking of the organization and the entity itself as opposed to your own individual self-interest. That's the same principle that we're, that we're supposed to um, you know, embrace here. 
as elected officials. S same thing, it's just yeah. the same principle. I just, I, I just thinking about of all of the work that we did because we got the information and we just pushed the system and I wouldn't want to limit any of our advocates in our positions from doing that, that's all. Well, you know. If you just serve on an advisory board. It just, and maybe it's not limiting. Maybe it's, you know, you do things in your official capacity, then you just say, no, I'm doing this in my personal capacity. And it's not part of the board. But. There's other language in here, and I understand your point, Commissioner, but for example, perform duties without bias for or against any individual group, provide opportunities for meaningful participation by all communities. There's also inclusive mm -hmm. language in there as well. I think what is um, this reflects is the board's effort to make sure that all ABCs were inclusive, were receptive, were not personalizing things, were not excluding folks in the community based on bias and that they were trying to have a collective conversation as opposed to uh, individual agendas and self-interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. I think that's all really good. All right, um, Commissioner Savas, you still want to speak? Uh, pause. Pause. Anybody else have any comments? Um, Mark, you have any comments on this? No, it looks good to me. I like Martha, it. Martha, looks good to me. I think we'll have to entertain a motion, Gary, yes, when please. Paul gets back to his yes. chair. Any final comments? Commissioner Savas. I had a thought and I, lo I lost it in, the, in, the, in this conversation. My card was up a while and I, I just forgot it. Okay, it well, was. I'll go ahead and entertain a motion. I move that we approve. The advisory member code of conduct policy as drafted and as presented here today. Second. Commissioner Savas has made a motion to approve the advis advisory member board code of conduct policy, seconded by Commissioner Schrader. Any further comments? Yeah, it was actually Commissioner Scholl made the made the made the, made the Oh, made Commissioner Scholl, excuse me, <coughs> and then Commissioner. And, and, and now I remember. Now I, I now I remember what it Maybe was. Maybe I told it. So my question was: I heard that you you ran this by CCI, correct? Right? And but my question is: um, Have we done anything else broader to some of these committees, just to say, by the way, do you have any ideas in improving or any you know, issue with them? You know, I just thought if we were going to be laying this, layering the, their responsibilities, that they were somehow had some input. But just asking. Yeah, we felt that CCI provided that broad um, uh, outreach, and the fact that this is already in existence, this is just making some revisions. It, it was not a wholesale change. That would be sufficient. Okay. It's pretty innocuous, anyhow. Yeah. Okay. So just a question, is it a problem to qualify the code of conduct requires all advisory members while serving in their official capacity? Would that be a problem adding that to this? Adding what? It says this code of conduct requires all advisory members and then it just has a colon. But if we said this code of conduct requires that all advise advisory members while they are serving in their official capacity and then have these bullet points. No, that would not offend or upset the intent of the policy. Yeah. So I would feel better about that. It's so do want, do really not necessary wording. It's the way it's worded now, I think, is quite adequate. I mean, what do people think? Are they comfortable with that? I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with as presented. I guess, because I think if we make any changes, I think it's almost incumbent upon us. But even though that's not a significant change. I just think it's a clarification. Well, doesn't this have to do with the ABCs, which by definition are appointed volunteers? But there's confusion about what people, about them thinking that they may not be able to use their voice if they are on an advisory committee. And so just clarifying that these apply to their official role, I think, is important. Well, I think there are some that actually are on the opposites and that think that their role is greater than that, that are beyond advisory. And that if we don't take their advice, then somehow, you know, we're not, we're not listening or we're not there with their, their effort or the committee itself is being circumvented if we don't take their advice. So I think there's two sides of that coin. Yeah, I'm not, uh, that's not really what I'm <coughs> wanting to amend here. I'm just wanting to clarify that it's while someone is serving in their official capacity. 
that this code of conduct applies to them. As opposed to? As opposed to every aspect of their life, because it's very broad the way it's worded. I mean, as we're county commissioners, we have a fiduciary duty to this process, and we follow that, and we we do what we need to do. But if we are in our, and that's in our official capacity, but if any one of us had a different view, and we wanted to go talk to a policymaker somewhere else, and we would need to say, this is not my commission, this is my personal view. We, every one of us has the right to do that. So I just think it's important to say here, because these are extensions of us, that it's when they're in their official capacity. Well, it's not as though there's anything punitive in here if they, if they violate that, right? So my, my point is that if they veer from that, from this, you know, what's the, what's the consequence? If there's none, then it's, I just it's think always it somewhat makes it clearer, moving. that's all. Because that's actually what it is, and it's just, sorry, it's just the words matter. There is a removal process, though, so that if they do deviate from the code of conduct and the bylaws, this board could remove them. Mm -hmm. So there, there is that in there. And the other component of this, which is new, is that you had asked for an acknowledgement by, by all ABC volunteers of the restrictions on political campaigning, of state ethics laws, of mandatory reporting, and that's what is on here as well as there's an acknowledgement form stating that when they are selected, they sign that they have been provided those uh, manuals and they're familiar with it. And our office will also volunteer to do training for them as well on those various aspects in a public meeting and public records. But to the commissioner's point, to get you to 5-0, her language that she's suggesting would not impair restrain, contract, or expand the scope of this. It does provide a slight bit more clarity versus while on duty as an ABC member versus while shopping at Fred Meyer in your, by yourself. Well, okay, I have a problem with that, just what you said. So while on duty as a volunteer during my two-hour meeting, I'm singing kumbaya with everybody, but yet when I go to the grocery store, I state another opinion of what, a different opinion of what the governing body has acted upon. That's pretty much a problem. Not for you, it wouldn't be. What do you mean? Well, if you're putting yourself in the same position as advisory boards, we're going way off track on this one, but these are volunteers. I know. And if they're out, if they're at the parks, NCPRD doing their volunteer work, and they're following the code of conduct in their official capacity, they're great. Let's say somebody goes to a Fred Meyer afterwards and they engage in some conduct that is not, does not comport itself with this. Mm -hmm. They exclude, they offend, they um, discriminate. Does that automatically, their off-duty conduct, does that result in a um, removal process by the board. It's just like an employee after Sometimes hours off does. duty at home, if he or she does something that doesn't, uh, isn't consistent with county employment policy, does that impair their employment relationship with their employer? Sometimes it does. Sometimes mm -hmm. off duty conduct can have a negative impact upon, upon the employer, absolutely. But what the language that uh, Commissioner Fisher was <coughs> proposing is that she was saying that for the purposes of the volunteer, these rules apply to them when they're serving in that capacity. I believe that was yep, the direction you were trying to go. Just for clarity, so that they understand that. Where is, where do you want that language inserted? This code of conduct requires that all advisory members. What page are you on, Sonia? Uh, it's page two. Page two of the, dr the of the new draft. While serving in their official capacity. Right here. Well, does somebody want to make a motion? Well, I move that we add to the end of. Yeah, if you want to amend the current motion, yeah, so you're yeah, making you an know, amendment to the current motion, motion on the floor right now. Okay. Yeah, there's a motion on the floor. <clears throat> I, I do have a question at some point, so. Um, who's the maker of the motion? Commissioner Scholl. It would require Commissioner Scholl to amend the motion. Commissioner Scholl does not want to amend the motion. 
So, since there is a motion on the table, Gary, according to Robert's rules, we proceed with the vote. So, Ashley, I'm sorry. Uh, anyone can amend the main motion, and you deal with the amendment first, and either right. passes or fails, and then it goes back to the main motion. Okay. Now, does the amendment need a concurring vote? It needs a second, and then okay. you vote. You have made an, a motion to amend the Thank motion. Thank you, Chair. Okay. We need a um, second on your amendment to the motion. Going once. This is an auction. <laughs> Going twice. Three times. I guess we're out on that. Um, now we will entertain the motion on the table, which was to adopt these uh, advisory rules as presented. That was made by Commissioner uh, Scholl. And who was the second? Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, we were in the in the comment question. Mode. Yes, we were. Yes, we were in the comment portion. Do you have a comment, Commissioner? Have, yeah, question. So, for example, <clears throat> this has happened for years here and there. So let's just say you're on a uh, CPO, and you know people are complaining about particular some particular code violation on a particular business. Let's just say. You know, and it's it's a policy that's the county. It's you know, the community council feels or CPO feels passionate about it. So in their in their off hours, they go and they, in their off hours outside the committee, in their in their capacity, apparently fuzzy here, whether it's their personal capacity or their capacity, they go and they approach the business owner, and they say, you don't really don't like that. That's a code violation. I'm with X, and you know so on and and. You know, those are, there's an altercation of sorts. I won't say physical, but, but you know, people are yelling at each other. I watched this happen one day, actually, by the way. Uh, you know, when I was in business, I watched someone do this. And um, so is that in their, in their, in their capacity to do this, this whole conversation about, <coughs> is it actually during, the, during the, the, the hours of the committee when the committee's meeting, or is it outside? I mean, it, it seems it's both in, the, in that particular example, right? They're, they're, mm -hmm. and, and they, and they, mm -hmm. and what, there are instances where they actually filed a, uh, a, a complaint. They don't live near the area, the business or the home or whatever it may be, but maybe they're in the boundaries maybe of the CPO. I mean, is that, is that an okay use and how is it covered here? So many scenarios. The CPO is a, Interesting example, because to be a member of a CPO, you just have to live somewhere. You could be inactive. It'd be an easier scenario if you had an active board member of, let's say, the NCPRD board. And are you on a site visit? Are you looking at a new park? Are you out there together, collectively? Are you a liaison position at that particular point? If you're a CPO board member doing it, different story. If you're just in a CPO, you're so far removed from official capacity, it's hard to tell. You understand what I'm trying to distinguish there? But it's case specific, just like the law is if a particular county employee is acting within the course and scope of their employment when they use excessive force on a jail inmate. Those are all very fact specific inquiries um, and it's not always an easy cut and dried answer. Yeah, and I, I speak to that, to, to basically to the, to the suggested change that Commissioner Fisher made that you know, some people carry that role outside of the the meeting the meeting period. Sure thing. It's just not uncommon. And I, I would think there should be a code of ethics that similar to this that people abide by. Well, just, Mark, just putting that out. I, 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 you know when you when you have a meeting you call a meeting to order and then you adjourn the meeting. When the meeting's adjourned you're done. Your meeting's over with. Your your functions in this capacity are over with. You go to the bar and have a beer and you know talk about things, but you're no longer in official capacity. Again, uh, very fact specific. If I'm leaving a board meeting with you guys and you adjourn and we're walking outside and I kick a participant, I am still the county council on county <laughs> property who's going to be subject to discipline by the board of county commissioners, even though I'm not paid to kick people. 
right? And even though I wasn't asked by anybody to kick people. So again, <laughs> it's a very fact-specific um, inquiry. Just because you're adjourned doesn't mean your role is done by <clears> any <throat> means. Like I said, you could be going on a site visit, you could be going on a liaison visit, you could be going out to an association of uh, county councils conference, things like that. This is better than what we had beforehand, and what we had beforehand was better than nothing, which is what we had before that. Okay, folks, yeah. we beat this dead horse more than I care to. Yeah. I'm going to call for a vote right now. <laughs> Mary, get ready and go fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner Fisher. No. Commissioner Schell. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Right, motion passes 4 1. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I promise I won't kick anybody. No, no. Okay. 13. Oh, I don't want to get kicked by that guy. Okay, uh, the last policy session contract for hauling and land applying dewatered biosolids, water environment services. Greg Geist, Chris Story, come forward, please. All right, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Greg Geist, director of Clackamas Water Environment Services. Uh, I'm gonna give a broad brush, and then Chris is gonna give the, the detail on this. This is a proposal to uh, contract out our long haul biosolids trucking. It's something we've been working on and looking at since 2019. Uh, we recently received a successful uh, bid uh, based on an RFP that we put out, and a high level, uh, what this does is saves our ratepayers about three and a half total, three and a half million dollars over the next five years. Uh, it significantly reduces uh, both Wes and the county's risk exposure if there were to be an accident uh, or an employee was injured. And um, what was the last thing? Uh, oh, and it, it does not result in layoffs for union employees or a decrease in the number of union uh, jobs within WES. If anything, these jobs will be repurposed to higher level classifications. So with that, I will hand it off to Chris. <clears throat> Chris. Good afternoon, commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Chris Story. I'm the assistant director of Water Environment Services. I'm going to run through the background a little bit more specifically, not because you don't know this, you are the governing body of WES and you understand this, but because if there are anybody watching this presentation, I want to make sure that they have the context to understand the deliberations. Uh, WES spends about two and a half, a little under two and a half million dollars per year on our resource recovery program. We focus on the tra transportation and beneficial reuse of biosolids, which is a resource that is recovered out of the wastewater treatment process. And I want to pause and acknowledge that your Channon Bays was the supervisor over this program for several years. And if you have any questions about that, you should be <laughs> sure to ask her as well. Uh, what we do is haul this over the Cascades to Sherman County to fields where it is beneficially applied to fields that uh, support crops that are not directly consumed by humans. Every application at a field is regulated by DEQ. We have to get each a specific field approval, and we have to make sure that there is no human contact or runoff into streams or other watersheds or bodies. It is a fairly expensive process. We haul around 11,000 tons a year. At least a truck a day is leaving the Tri-City plant. What generated this conversation is uh, in the late 20 teens, which seems weird to say out loud, in 8, 2018 or so, we had two accidents. Uh, the first was the rolling of a tarragator, which is the tractor piece of equipment that we use to apply the biosolids in the fields in uh, central Oregon. Our employee was alone. The equipment was totaled, but fortunately the employee was not injured. Uh, and we also had an accident where one of our trucks that was hauling uh, ran into a passenger car on I-84. Again, fortunately, there were no injuries, but it really spurred us to take a deep look at how the, the program is operating and if there's a way to do it differently. Uh, that was seconded by our asset management group, which noted that we have several million dollars of upcoming purchases of equipment related to this program because we need to replace the fleet that does the hauling. So we engaged an outside consultant, uh, Donovan and Associates, and I will note Mr. Donovan is here if we need to dive down to that level of detail, which I frankly hope we don't, uh, and asked him to take a look and see what our peers are doing, what we're doing, and what might be the options. And the short answer was that we seem to be an outlier in this area. 
the majority of our peer agencies, including the City of Portland and Washington County, contract out this work. The City of Portland has been contracting it out for 30 years, and we, uh, we do it in-house. So we looked at what that might be from a savings standpoint. We brought that forward after some conversation with the union. We actually presented the draft of the analysis to the union on a couple different occasions and allowed them to provide feedback, point out any flaws in the analysis that they might be able to find or concerns. And we talked through that and ultimately got approval to solicit a proposal to see whether or not our analysis would match what the market would provide. We have now received a bid from a company to do the work, and the bid is actually a bit better than what we were estimating in the analysis. Uh, so to briefly walk you through the results of that, if this was to go forward, we'd estimate a savings of approximately 1.4 million on a per ton basis for the hauling, which includes both labor, equipment, gas, maintenance, et cetera. The risk transfer, which we don't really have a number for, but we do think it is substantial. Uh, fleet, fleet replacement savings, which frankly is of great excitement to our capital program if they don't have to fund it because we were looking at purchasing a lot of equipment in the next five years, which we are estimating at about $1.7 in avoided costs. Again, that's in net present value dollars. We tried to make an apples to apples comparison so the board would have a fair comparison. We also have existing equipment that would no longer be needed that we, could, we estimate we could sell for a little bit over half a million dollars. There is some benefits in continuing the program. Certainly there have been some questions from our advisory committee and others about why don't we just haul to a landfill. And that would be a slightly, the mm -hmm. slightest bit cheaper than applying it to fields. But consistent with the county's sustainability goals and climate action plan, we think, it, think it's important to continue to support uh, the return of these natural resources to the environment rather than sealing them off in landfills. And again, as Director Geis noted, there will be no negative impact to our employees. We had two people that were working these jobs, and when we started the analysis in 2019, they have both retired uh, during the dependency, so the positions have been supported through temp drivers during that time until we had clarity which way the program was going. So no current employees would be impacted by this decision. And with that, I think I will just pause. Okay, any questions for the presenters today? Commissioner any Fisher. Questions? Thank you. Oh, Paul, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, 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 this is kind of awkward, but I, I thought when this was discussed in executive session for a, a valid reason, um, it was left with, um, unless, some, unless I get, maybe I missed an email or missed a meeting, but it was left with a couple questions and an inquiry. And to have it back here on the agenda without those responses, <clears throat> I feel like, I feel a need to, um, re not recuse, but abstain. So the board did direct in that session to come to a public session to discuss this, fully vetted for the public to hear, to review the contract, which I understand is not in the packet yet, so that still has to come back before the board, and to answer the questions publicly that the board had asked you in private. I think the, impo uh, the public um, discussion was important. If you look under your recommendations, it says staff recommends option one to bring the contract back to us to discuss. So before that is done, we have an opportunity <coughs> to vet this fully here now, Paul, if you have more questions. I, frankly, Paul, I'm sorry, I don't remember what those questions that were asked were. Have you responded to the questions? Well, my understanding was you, you asked for the contract and there, we don't have the contract yet. We're waiting, you know, we, we've, we put out the request for proposals. We've got, met, had a successful bidder. Um, we've issued a notice of intent to award, and now we would sit down and negotiate the contract. Uh, yeah, it was, it was an executive session material. Right. I, I, was, was the mm -hmm. question. So I, I, would res, I would assume the response would come back due to labor negotiations and executive session. And Why don't you ask the question now? It's executive session. Well, I think it was probably answered in executive session it was and not. or. It was not. Uh, I, the conversations that I heard, keeping mm -hmm. the bounds of executive session privilege, was what was the level of engagement with our collective bargaining unit around the discussions for this contract? I which I think that. there was a follow up uh, email that was shared with the board that outlined the process from November 2019 till now, um, showing the, the level of review. I also recall uh, a question around comparator wages 
that we had hoped to follow up on. Um, however, the company that submitted the bid, Triveca, is under no obligation to provide us that information. We mm. have asked, and they have not provided. Indeed, most private companies would be very reluctant to share their internal cost uh, numbers because it gives a competitive advantage to the people they're right. competing against. Right. Uh, so we are not able to provide that information in any form. I remember that email now that you say it. Yeah. And, it's uh, hard to remember everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the wages issue, I mean, Eric, Sarah, uh, during that session looked up, they, this company have, happened to have an ad on uh, Indeed.com at the time, and it was 33 to $38 an hour. Right. And, okay. and we pay um, uh, 20, 23 to 30 is, is okay. from this top, top of grade. Other questions, Paul? The, the sender of the email was who? I believe Director Geis forwarded it around sort of looking at Administrator Schmidt, but I believe it was circulated to the entire board. I don't remember. I'd have to look. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah. So I was interested in understanding where the opposition might be with this, and I did um, reach out to Ross Kiley with Ask Me, had a good conversation about big picture, what all of the issues involved, and I have a whole list of questions. I'm really interested, you say that they were just fine, that they went through the process and the... Uh, I, I would say, and I think this email reflects this, they expressed concern generally about the idea of the work being contracted out. <clears throat> Their preference was that the work stayed union positions and that Wes add positions to okay. do the other work that we talked about repurposing to. Okay, so I, I misunderstood the presentation today. Uh, yeah, lots of questions, probably not, I mean, I can forward them. I don't know if we wanna go through them now. I guess some of the, just the big picture piece, and you know, I just know that accidents can happen, things can go bad, This accidents have happened, and yet I get concerned if we don't have some control over the, the process, the, um, the workforce, the wages, the benefits, the, and we just contract it out without any say in any of that. And then the other piece, just big picture, so we have this equipment. If we sell it all for, what, $500,000, if this and this prevent this protects us from having to make capital improvements that we need to make right now in order to continue the work. But what happens if it doesn't work out and we are in a worse position? Doesn't it kind of lock us into a we can't get out of it? We can't ever go back to then. It's just we would become cost prohibitive. I mean that kind, that kind of scares. It, it would be a big transition to go back. What we're planning on doing is keeping that equipment for. Yeah. two, maybe even three years, uh, just to make sure that we're testing out the contract. Um, this entity has been doing this for decades, um, and virtually all of our peers have been doing this for decades mm -hmm. um, as a contract service. It's very similar. I mean, we're highly dependent on the chemicals that we get, and those are, you know, the, those come in, you know, and, and there was actually a supply chain disruption over the summer. Luckily, we were fine, but... Uh, there is always that risk. We can't do everything, and, and we're at, at heart we are not a fleet management expert. Uh, we we've managed to get by, uh, but Tribeca does it better. This is what they do, um, and they're the experts. And so we feel very confident that uh, moving forward, this is this is just the way this business works now. And Mr. Fisher, if you have more questions, go ahead and ask them. Yeah, and, and if I could uh, extend on, I think on your initial point as far as the, the control and the regulatory issues, I will observe you're, you're highlighting something important that I, I failed to mention, which is we remain ultimately responsible from a regulatory standpoint. We are regulated under the Clean Water Act to ensure the compliance with all the rules. Our contract would require the contractor to be uh, consistent with our practices. We have to file a plan with DEQ about how the biosolids will be managed and applied and there will be sampling and, you know, reviews that our staff will do to ensure compliance on their part. Uh, so there is a, a transfer of responsibility of the majority of the work, but we will be keeping oversight and some regulatory insight into their work going forward. Yeah. 
So it's just a concern, us giving up that control. And the other piece, so I don't know who's available to do this work. I know that Tribeca is the one that was named. I don't know if there are other entities, if this is a competitive. It is. I understand that they're based in Washington. Um, I always, I mean, local is a priority for Clackamas County, from, you know, helping our economy. So I'm concerned in that respect. Um, and to respond to that point, well, well, again, good point. We should have mentioned that in our presentation. There are at least three different regional providers. The city of Portland uses a different provider. Uh, this Washington County uses the provider that is the successful bidder for our process. The city of Salem and the city of Gresham use a third provider. So we do have confidence that there is sufficient supply of vendors that we would not be stuck in some sort of monopolistic situation where there was only one option for us. And, and I would also add, this is a specialized equipment, you know, the, the, the trucks and the spraying equipment. And so there isn't anyone in Clackamas County that uh, can do this type of hauling and, and land application. It's not moving freight. It's pretty different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my other questions would be more appropriate for executive session. I don't feel comfortable asking them now. You don't feel comfortable asking them? No. How are you going to get your answers? Do you want to submit no, them? No, I mean, we email? can talk about it. And it's just going to come back. So part of the challenge we have, uh, just to be totally transparent with the board, it's only the impact of bargaining that's eligible for a discussion in executive session, and we tried very hard in the exec session to adhere just to that topic. Mm -hmm. It is not typical for us to have exec sessions around contracts, and Mr. Macro can speak to that to far greater skill or detail than I can. But uh, when we talk about the contract itself, uh, our normal procurement process is we solicit bids, and then we just put it on the board's agenda at a business meeting for dialogue. Uh, and potential approval. Because of uh, the sensitivity around our employees, we wanted to make sure that this issue was fully vetted with the board before it went to a business meeting. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that we answer any questions that you have in whatever venue it would be appropriate. Right. But at the end of the day, this isn't just another contract similar to the one that I've talked to you about this morning and you'll see on the business meeting. But just again, because of what Chris just outlined, we wanted to have more thorough dialogue before we bring it to a business meeting. So I would suggest any commission who has questions, they could submit them to Greg or um, Chris. Chris, I'm sorry. My mind went blank. Um, beforehand and we can discuss them later, quite possibly. We have two more commissioners' cards up. I think, Commissioner Scholl, you're up. Yes, Trebek has been providing this service for other counties and cities effect, effectively yes. without problems. Yes. Your uh, estimate that by contracting this out will save the county $3.5 million in over a five-year period? Our, our rate payers, yes. Our rate payers, yeah. Rate payers. My, my feeling is that your option one looks good to me. It makes sense. You've given this a lot of thought, and uh, I would recommend we do option one. Okay. Um, Gary, if we pass option one today, what's the next step for the contract review? Uh, so staff will go forward with a contract, and then we'll come back to you one more time. When? On, in a policy on a, session? On a Tuesday issues for your approval to put on a consent agenda. Okay. That's uh, Mark, you want to make a motion to that effect? Yes. I move that this board uh, vote to approve. Uh, to direct the staff to bring forward the contract awarding long haul transportation and application of biosolids for board approval to realize the 3.5 million in <coughs> anticipated savings. I'll second that. Uh, Commissioner Scholl has made a motion uh, to accept option one on the biosolids removal, and Commissioner Schrader has seconded that motion. Comments? Seeing none, Mary, please call the poll. Commissioner Fisher? No. Commissioner Schull? Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Savas? Abstain. Um, Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 3 1 1. Thank you very much. 
Can I ask one clar clarifying question? You bet. So um, the intent here was that we were going to discuss it today, and it would go on a uh, essentially a consent agenda like any other contract. But what I heard Gary no. say, the board needs to see the contract. Okay. Sorry. I think that might be a little bit different from past contracts, but I think there's enough questions being risen today. Commissioners, if you have questions, by the time we review this next time, you need to have those an questions submitted and answered uh, either in open session or um, privately with staff. Yeah. And I will go back and verify that I sent that email. Sure, go ahead, Greg. I, I saw the email, by the way, and oh, Chair, yeah. I just want to just say that my, my firm recollection is that uh, those, ans those answers, those questions to be answered were to be come back in executive session and that they were um, labor related. I, I don't remember that, but then, you know, not everybody's memory is perfect, including yours and mine. So I suggest you just get those a questions answered as best you can. Uh, you know, we just need to move forward with this. Get your questions answered in a way that's satisfactory so we can continue with Wes's business and the county's business. Gary, so what's Stephen that? Stephen advised me uh, that he, we can't bring this back to executive session next Tuesday to finalize any questions you may have because it's still labor relations related. Okay. Um, however, with all respect, I looked at my notes as well and I take very, very careful notes at your direction board and it said bring this to a public session. So maybe it was both, but still you did direct us to come today, which is why we're here. We'll come back to executive session on Tuesday to wrap it up. That's it. And if, if you can give us those questions in advance, we'll make sure to research them as best we can. Thank you. Thank you. All right, commissioners, we're back to the issues list. Uh, potential joint city county letter on traffic diversion due to tolling. Chair Smith. Okay. In my meetings with the mayors, um, the chairs and mayors meeting, uh, for the last three months, they have all expressed concern over tolling on I-205 and the diversion into their cities, their city streets and county streets. And it's really coming to a head now in my last, in my last meeting last week with them. Uh, they have, well, they would like the county and the chair specifically and the mayors of each city to pen a letter to ODOT and the Oregon Transportation Committee, Commission, excuse me, discussing the tolling if I-205 is told before other areas in the region and the effects that it will have on that. And I have discussed this with staff. I have discussed it with um, Everett Wild and Dan Johnson. I discussed it with Emily. And what we would like to do, the process is, I said I would have our PGA staff along with the transportation staff pen a letter, bring it to this board, a draft to this board with our transportation value statement in mind. Remember that one we passed? And I asked the mayors of the cities, do you remember that? Yes, they remembered that, they liked it. I says, okay, some of those values will be in that. After our board looks at the draft, then we will send it to each of the mayors for their comments, additions, subtractions, whatever they wanna do for that. Um, it's gonna take a while to do that. So, what I'm asking, you know, your opinion on that moving forward uh, is something that, you know, I can send a letter. Frankly, I can send a letter whenever I want to send a letter. But this is a, this is a very um, unique situation in that it affects multiple cities. Uh, and so I'm bringing it forward to you folks to see what your opinion on that is. I know that uh, timing is an issue with this. I discussed timing. Uh, about uh, going forward on this and when that could be. Now, the Oregon Transportation Commission does not meet in December. I wanted the letter to go in November, uh, but there's another uh, bid process going on um, in December. And so I'm thinking that if we can get this letter out in December before break, then I would make a call to Bob, the chair of the Oregon Transportation Commission, and submitted it, submit it to him and any other people that we think that can listen to this. Comments? Sonia. Yeah, I think we really need a strong, united voice. <laughs> this is one of the, my three o'clock in the morning conversations that I have with myself. Mm -hmm. 
And I just had another one. I don't know if it was at 3 o'clock this last morning <laughs> or the morning before. But it's, you know, the, um, was it the regional, what was that called, the study, Paul, the regional study, congestion price. I know we're talking tolling, but <coughs> the, 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 they're combined, the issues are combined. One of their priority value statements is equity throughout the region. And, you know, I can't, in my brain, figure out a way that for the people that live in Clackamas County, that tolling, especially the Abernathy Bridge, that's good for them. It's going to, we can do a way that's equitable, but for the people that live here. And we really need to figure this out. There needs to be like some exception for the people in, that live in Clackamas County that have no other option. There needs to be a different way of looking at this because it is just simply, there's no other way. There's really, you can go over the Oregon City Bridge, but you know, we keep, that can't, that kind of diversion can't happen. It's just not tenable. Lord, mm -hmm. I don't have the answer, but we cannot, this cannot go forward. The, to cities, the, who are, the cities who want to join this letter are Wilsonville, Lake Oswego, West Lynn, Oregon City, Camby, Tualatin, Gladstone, and Riverdale. Mm -hmm. They are all equally concerned. And I know that, you know, this is part of the, uh, the group that meets, the uh, C4 group, but this is a letter from the mayors and the chair, and I do not believe it would be in conflict to anything that uh, the other groups <coughs> may be doing. Mark, you had your card. I think Paul was before Paul, me. go ahead. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I won't say confused, but I am slightly in the sense that, um, you know, this is a complex thing because there's so many things on the table that are tolling and there's so many things of that or congestion pricing or that can lead to diversion. And um, I think that value statement that we all approved, I think, um, laid out you know, our concerns and, you know, perhaps, I won't say necessarily remedies, but what we were striving to accomplish. And then May 10th came around, I think, I think it was May 10th. May 10th came around and we were in a hurry up rush apparently to, you know, to, to be asked to support HB 30, 55 or 65 or both. And, um, you know, I remember having the concern, knowing the concerns I'm even hearing today, but having them back then and in my mind, how we were going to thread the needle um, with regard to trying to get some of those accommodations to alleviate whether it's diver diversion or what it may be. So, you know, in essence, we had a great opportunity at that point in time to leverage significantly um, prior to the legislature passing the bill. I thought we had a tremendous opportunity. So now our, our, our leverage is greatly reduced. Um, and the other thing that's on the table that I'm a little bit confused with with the mayors, I guess, is that at the Metro, C4 Metro subcommittee, uh, when we position ourselves for a conversation with JPAC on congestion pricing or tolling or diversion, all these things, we know they have, there's a city's representative, and that city's representative is um, Council President Kathy Heise, and, you know, they met separately from the C4 Metro subcommittee a couple times and and granted the conversation was related slightly to the regional transportation plan the RTP it really was about the prospect of trying to get more analysis of what that diversion and the economic impacts and all the things that would be created by congestion pricing or tolling and um, so if you ask for a remedy for congestion pricing or tolling because of diversion, some people are going to come up with, then the best thing to do is to toll everything, including local roads. So that's way. So you have to be careful about what you ask for because it's that heavily nuanced. All to say, I'm a little bit confused because um, I'm not really sure exactly what why the mayor apparently or why the cities took a particular position at the JPAC table a month ago and then say this when to me they're, they are not directly related but they are related. 
the other thing I want to put out there, and I'll close with this, is that um, I can't, you know, I wish staff were here right now, but I can't remember if it was ODOT that was doing it or if it was ourselves that were putting together a diversion task force of the elected officials in this corridor that you just mentioned. Not all of those folks are, are, are there. Riverdale, for example, I didn't hear their name, but I think it was going to be Wilsonville, Lake Oswego, Westland, Oregon City, Gladstone, so on, that were directly related. You know, and myself, I would sit on there as well, representing the commission on how we would potentially address diversion, the very thing that they're asking for. And I thought that invitation went out to all the mayors. I just don't know. I haven't had time to call them up on the phone and say, hey, you know. Um, so I think it's better to do what we do coordinated. I, I support, I, I don't disagree with that, but I think it's, it, it, is it timing or is it, what is, it, what is it what it says or is it in coordination with? So as your transportation person, I appreciate Chair, you sharing that, and I, I saw that, but um, you know, I haven't had enough time. We discussed a little bit yesterday, yeah, yesterday at our transportation meeting, but hadn't had enough time because I really didn't know what the substance really was, and I wanted to just lay this out there, and so. Well, I think um, answers to your questions, we will create the substance. I don't go to C4, Paul. I don't know what you guys decide. I used to go to C4 when I was a previous commissioner, and I scarcely remember anything ever getting accomplished or decided there because there were so many disparate views across the table. I suspect they didn't say to me anything about C4. I suspect without knowing for sure, the mayors feel that they're not being listened to by ODOT or the Oregon Transportation Commission about the impacts that tolling I-205 will have on their cities, and that's what they want to express their opinions for. Um, we decided that uh, our numbers are greater together than they are separately. Um, I also think this is an opportunity for the county to work closely with our cities together on one issue that we can all agree on at the same time, and I think that's a very valuable um, What's the word I want to use, Gary? Solidarity. Solidarity, yeah, that's a good term, uh, Mark, going forward. Um, now, my, my, my one concern is timing, probably sometime in December. But we want, um, we, we want these groups to, to pay attention. You know, we've met, um, the questions you pose ODOT doesn't seem to have answers or want to have answers to, and you, and you know that. So without ODOT being forthcoming in, gee, how much is a toll going to be? We don't know. How are you going to collect the toll? Well, we don't know. What lanes are you going to toll? Well, we don't know. Are you going to toll all lanes at once? Well, we don't know. Are you gonna, and, but there is the thought out there that Clackamas County could be tolled sooner than the others, and that is not equitable. Also what is not equitable is tolling all lanes at the same time, as you know, and I suspect that letter will address that. So I have a friend from Southern California. She's lived there for <clears throat> 30 years, and tolls in California are all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. And so I explained to her <clears throat> what the, some of the proposals were her here. And she says, my God, California doesn't even do that. If we're going to toll uh, to build a new highway, we always have the toll lane. You can go, you know, you go fast through there. Then we have a carpool lane, and then we have a toll lane. We have a lane that's not tolled, so people can divert the tolls on the existing freeways. That's right. So nobody else in the world does what I think ODOT is proposing to do. That's what our objection is, to look at it uh, with a more holistic view care of the citizens and maybe what other jurisdictions are doing that have a lot of traffic concerns like California. That's where we're going with this, Paul. And you can certainly make, uh, make an input in this uh, letter too. So that's, that's basic what I know. I think it's a good opportunity for, the, for us um, as a county to work with these cities together on a common, <laughs> the common enemy, so to speak. Yeah, I, I would suggest we get our staff, the transportation staff, to help with that. I have. You think that I would not do that? No, I'm just, I'm just saying it. They have been in my office this week, and they know what to do to go ahead with that, along with PGA and in our transportation value statement. Yeah. 
What yeah. I'd like to do, uh, to be honest with you, is at least from a timing standpoint, I would like to get this <clears throat> committee, I think it's gonna meet for the first time in about a week and a half or two, this diversion committee to get assembled and formed and so we can figure out what the scope is at the first meeting. I don't know what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, the purpose is diversion, you know, a diversion committee. But I would certainly like to make sure that um, the committee gets a chance to meet. And um, I'm assuming that some of the people you talk to, the mayors, uh, will be part of that at that table as well. And I can, I can broach it between now and then and then. Um, to figure out how they what what thoughts they have as well. So with something maybe we can start working and have be a work in progress. I'm I'm I support it. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, but I'm just trying to figure out how, to, how we make it the most effective. And um, and it may not be the last letter either. We don't know. Yeah. And uh, but I do think there is power in, in in going forward with something like this. It's just not popular. I think it's also. This is a good action to take for our citizens who come forward and express their angst over tolling. Um, and, and, and let's face it, it hasn't even hit our population yet. There, there are more people out there that aren't even aware that tolling could be happening. And then all of a sudden it hits and everything is gonna blow up, blow up in our face. So depending on the magnitude of this letter, I would also like to send it to our legislators as uh, just to CC them on what Clackamas County um, local electeds are thinking um, to our Clackamas County delegation at least on that and to the members of the Oregon Transportation Commission and the head of ODOT unless you guys have anything else to do. But the substance of the letter has not been developed yet. I wanted to bring it forward here today. Uh, the, yeah, the part that confuses me is that how many people say they don't support it, but then they, then they vote for it. You mean elected? Yes. Yes. All right, staff will draft a letter and we'll bring it back to you. Okay. Uh, final item today is Commissioner Communications. Paul, you're up first. Um, this morning, um, Chair, when you stepped out for your... Um, business you had to do, um, speaking business, whatever it was, um, we had a discussion at, about NCPRD and what I wanted to at least not share the executive elements of that, but at least make you all aware that there is a couple things brewing. I don't want anyone to be surprised. Um, you know, we have uh, a new DAC formed for NCPRD. We've held off a lot of business um, because the we wait waiting for the for this advisory committee to be back up and running to help give their get their guidance um, and um, on a few things that we literally have held back on and multi over the couple three years that they've been in hiatus you know we have actually sided what those really are in public session and so I, they're 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 fresh in some people's <laughs> minds and uh, we also have um, and I didn't you know, it was kind of surprised last night on the library side and a couple projects that are on hold, been on this four month hold, that there is a brewing concern out there that some projects may go forward and some projects may not go forward. And I think that that insecurity or that question is um, mounting. Um, and uh, there were some pretty strong statements made last night. This was a library meeting, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, the, all the city libraries, not all the city libraries, but it's a, it's a table where all the city li libraries have a seat. Most of the city libraries were there. Um, but there are some, some things that related to the parks district as well um, with a couple of those or one of those. So I um, just want to let you know that there's some technical challenges like I kind of alluded to with ELED where the voters intent, or what they voted for is not, not being realized and same thing goes with libraries and same thing goes with parks. You know, there were certain things that were put in there that gave, gave the advisory role of those bodies specific powers. And um, when they feel that they're not really being included or being circumvented, um, that makes them a little bit um, upset. So I'm just giving you a heads up that if we get some people that you've, if you're contacted by folks or however it may appear um, at whatever time, uh, I don't know how we're going to tackle it because there's, there's, there's three of them right now. Three. Library, Concord, 
The park at the Concord. Yeah, the library right. parks district thing. And a, and a little bit, the ELED is not one that's 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 going to any near term any issue, but but that's one that's been out there. But just want to let you know that there is advisory capacity. And so you have LDAC that has an advisory capacity and, a, and they considered a mission and a role. COVID, I talked to them last night to try to talk them into say, hey, you know, the, what the procedure we had in place was put on hold because of COVID. And um, so I tried to calm them down. So our staff were in the room. So it was a, it was a, a, a county LDAC meeting. And um, so, you have the, so you also have the other library boards and you also have the task force boards for Concord and also the DAC, the NCPRD District Advisory Committee. So, so I want to let you know there's some tensions there that are, that are growing. I suspected there would be. I don't know specifically um, since you know you attended, but we'll just have to manage that the best we can going forward on, on trying to get to resolution and goal to build the library, two libraries in the park over there. Yeah, I talked to Gary. Gary's I'm keeping Gary apprised, um, you know, so if he feels anything. So, but I, I don't want you all to be surprised. I feel it's my duty as a year liaison to just leech to make you aware. I don't want you to be surprised. Thank you very much for that, Commissioner Scholl. You're up. No. Uh, don't have anything no, to say, Commissioner Schrader. No, I don't really have anything either. I do have a, a couple of questions that I'm concerned about with the LDAC. So this is the first I've heard that LDAC has been in, directly involved uh, with Concord and then what's going on in Gladstone, well, is that correct? Or, or when did they start to enter no. the picture here with that? Sorry about that. Um, yeah. I was trying to make it brief, but um, the, LDAC, the LDAC piece is um, what was yeah, in the measure. Use the time, yeah. Was in the measure, right? And so basically, the district is a, is a pass-through district. So the revenues in the library district, are, right, go by, through by intergovernmental that. agreement, are, are sent to the cities. And how the cities spend those, which was a board issue before, when a city spends them inconsistent. For example, Cap there, there's some language in there that suggests that those do those funds are only to be used for operations and maintenance and not capital projects. Right, I remember that. Yeah. 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 So. There's a person, uh, one of our members of the LDAC committee, that is being, and being very, and and has support, some support in the room about um, feeling it's a violation of the voters' intent. What to build the libraries? No, to be to use capital funds, um, and also to 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 have excess dollars unidentified. So there's some some of these libraries are building reserves, in in essence, they're un, un, unexpended funds. And it's complex. It's complex. I'll, I'm happy to talk to you about it. But, but basically, um, she feels um, this one particular person feels and is very articulate, very smart, um, but feels that you know we uh, or they, and this was going to are being are are um, in violation basically. So. And we knew this a long time ago that it was an issue, and the library board folks and our staff suggested, as you recall, uh, we'll get this task force going, we'll try to solve all these problems with how much each city or area gets and library gets, and make some adjustments and ideas on how to solve these things. Well, because of COVID, that task force work was put on hold. And we have, we're not out of COVID yet. And I, I just told them that the timing's not really right, in my opinion, but if you want to raise it, send a letter to the board again, because they already sent a letter a couple of years ago prior to. Well, then we need to get another letter to get yeah, this, so because um, I'm, my concern is that we're, I'm, I'm seeing the tension between Milwaukee and the unincorporated area about who goes first with who builds what first, and that's the park and the library. And, and now they're getting, now LDAC is getting involved in that discussion that's what i'm trying to uh, ask just not not really but a little bit just 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 a little bit in the sense that some of the members are one and the same and so that that mm -hmm. tension that tension is is okay. growing it's like okay. contagious okay well that's no. interesting sorry all righty martha um, that's it that's okay commissioner say. fisher yeah, I look forward to having us having policy sessions on Wednesday because I have three meetings, 4.30, 5.30, and 6 this evening. So um, I am not really like splitting up our Tuesdays and, and sharing them on Wednesdays. Because um, that's, yeah, so but it's only three now, so that's good. My first meeting doesn't start until 4.30 with the Mental Health Advisory Council. 
which is oh, a good. great group of folks. Good. And then there is a child care task force kickoff that's tonight, and then the local, um, not local, leaders of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I will pop in at various various moments for all of those. I um, There is, on Thursday, my human services and education meeting is not usually on Thursdays at 11 our time, but it is this Thursday, and there's some issues that are happening there around what's happening with childcare. And so I'm thinking that I need to step out of our board meeting. And then take it in your office. At 11 and do this call. I'm gonna look more at the agenda to see how I can maneuver that around, but I just wanted to give folks a heads up that yeah. I may need to move over there. Things are really moving in that area. Things are really percolating here locally and there's a real opportunity I don't know what's gonna happen federally with Build Back Better. If I had a crystal ball, which I don't, I would think that things will not pass necessarily within that piece of legislation, but some of the concepts that have really been um, identified and the strategies and priorities for what local communities need are very important. So there is an effort to align around values and principles and, and carry the advocacy forward at the national level. And I just think it's important to, to connect those uh, Yeah, our meeting agenda is not that long tomorrow. I think if we efficient use of our time, mm -hmm. you could probably attend most of the meeting and then go do that would be Yeah, really that'd fine. be great. And I can always listen to um, any reports or commissioner communications. I listened to our last meeting. He's not seeing to, to do that. <laughs> Put it on my car and... Um, put YouTube on and drive along, and there we go, listening to our commission meeting. Mr. Schrader. Yeah, so I did have a question for you, Commissioner, because um, as you know, community economic and workforce development, and the meeting tonight is being convened by workforce. Uh-huh, uh -huh. Right. And I know that your national committee, as well as my national committee, are both working on these They're issues. Working on it. So Tracy told me that, that you had a conversation mm -hmm. and that you wanted to write a letter of support from your national committee in support of this, uh, the federal legislation. No, it's not no. really support of the federal legislation because or, that's a little bit too controversial. The thought will be, I think it is, actually. <laughs> The idea would be if there are principles that the counties agree on that are going to be important in future efforts. That's what I would be advocating okay. for. Well, and your group actually has already been working on a letter yes. of which it will That's probably be thinking. our group will come along with you yeah. because it is more principle and strategy based. That's what I was going to point out. Yep. I'm aware of that. And also I'm aware with the child care issue. I know that I went to the webinar the day before you had your meeting mm -hmm. with your person about how child care is an economic driver. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful this time that the Safe Kids Coalition will be on board with this because they weren't, child care was not something that um, came up in their conversations when they wanted to do their levy. So are they in alignment? Do you know now? Yeah, no, they have their, their last meeting I could not attend. It was on a, I was mm -hmm. otherwise engaged, so I'm not sure where they are. But if you look at, are you going to be on the meeting tonight? Tonight I will be, yes. Okay, so I was just looking at who's attending there t this evening, and there are a lot of people invited. So that should be an interesting conversation. I don't have an agenda for that meeting. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if you do. I don't know if I do. It's either. just beautifully out. on my calendar. But a lot of stakeholders invited that... Um, Mm -hmm. the, the, it has taken taken off? No, but I saw this a number of months ago. That's why my frustration, uh, because I've been working on child care for a very long time. I guess I should get over here. I've been working on this for a very long time, and I knew back then that it was going to become a big deal locally and federally. And I just hope that we can all align this time on that being a priority because it really didn't, was not a priority back then. And it is something that's very near and dear, dear to my heart. I think that um, I appreciate your um, coming on board with this initiative. 
that uh, I've been working on for so long. Thank you. Uh, Chair, if I may, on, yeah. this, on, on this topic, I just kind of just want to just jump in. I, I, I appreciate Commissioner Schrader's um, in her role or her roles on as a liaison in different things, and she has been very good about bringing things back and keeping us up to date. Um, and we rarely get any kind of surprises, and I just think that's just the good work that Commissioner Schrader has done. So I appreciate that, and I would want to make sure that, you know, whatever we do in our liaison surprise uh, um, assignments do not, you know, go go astray or lead us, you know, lead us down a path in which, you know, we end up with, you know, big challenges. Um, and um, so what, whatever goes on in that realm, um, knowing that Commissioner Schrader has been, I think, the tip of the spear on that one, I would want to make sure that, that um, that flow of information on that topic is um, comes to all of us um, timely, and I'm sure that Commissioner Schrader will do that. So, whatever Commissioner Fisher is working on, I'm hoping that she works closely, you know, alongside Commissioner Schrader to make sure that um, you know we're all apprised. And I again, I think that um, you know it's important. Uh, we had a we had a, a town hall on it. You know, and, and um, <clears throat> it, it is a big issue, um, and I just, I just want to make sure that we yeah. we're in the loop. Like. I've already heard more today already. I guess that comes not as a surprise, but I would certainly just want to just be updated. Okay. Yeah, um, absolutely. That goes with anything any of us are working on. Okay. okay. Any other comments? I really don't have anything. Thank you, all commissioners. Good work. And this meeting is adjourned.